the setup for a uh, third, for a chemical peel trichloroacetic acid is uh, fairly simple and straightforward, but I think it's important to review uh, the components. Now, the first um, is the fan. We just take that, Kathy. Sometimes there are some uh, uh, handheld fans that uh, serve well, but uh, we find something that, that's a little bigger uh, works much better to blow across the patient's face. It's also important for the um, patient not to hold the fan, um, especially when you're giving them a little sedation because they, they become groggy and then the fan is off in a different direction. Uh, the degreasing and cooling the patient down is uh, performed with a non-filled 4x4 gauze. We have a little ice, um, ice bucket with um, a uh, bowl and some saline to keep the uh, iced eye pads and uh, pads in for uh, cooling down the patient's face. Uh, cotton tip applicators are used uh, in the periorbital area primarily, not just to apply, but also with the assistant using this to wick the tears out. Now, we go primarily uh, by the patient's um, reaction or um, a complaint of discomfort. If the patient complains at all, and that's why it's so important not to have them too sedated about uh, burning or discomfort in the eye, at that point we reach for the saline or BSS and we irrigate the eye. Um, it's important not to squirt this right into the patient's eye, but have the, to look, squirt this into the medial cantal area and that will run across uh, the eye and flush the eye. Um, that sounds like a, a very minor point, but as you uh, squirt this right in the patient's eye, not only is it uncomfortable, but they tend to turn away and not cooperate. Um, so here's our acetone, uh, which is what we use for um, degreasing the patient. The 35% trichloroacetic acid, and as one begins, you may want to start with a, a lower concentration. By more applications and additional time, you can uh, achieve the same result. And here's the uh, Jesner solution, which both of these we have uh, formulated on a um, weight by weight basis. And um, at a local pharmacy, you can also order these uh, from one of the other dermatologic uh, uh, supply catalogs. Uh, there are just a couple of other uh, small points to mention. First of all, the acetone is 100% uh, acetone that can be purchased at any um, hardware store, um, essentially, and used. Um, it's relatively inexpensive. It's important not to use nail polish rem remover, but it's 100% uh, acetone. The other, and maybe a fairly obvious point, is that we do like to wear um, um, gloves, non-sterile gloves. It's not necessary for uh, sterility reasons, but um, the acetone uh, tends to be very drying on the surgeon's hands if you're doing uh, a, these with any degree of frequency. It become very, can become very irritated. And as well, uh, even though the fingers have much thicker skin, you don't want to be applying uh, Jesner's and trichloroacetic acid uh, on a regular basis to your hands um, because you can uh, actually um, inadvertently injure them. Okay, Margaret, we're going to uh, begin the, uh, the peel at this point, and uh, we prefer to use uh, a uh, light sedate or some sedation with a uh, chemical peel. Our standard chemical peel and um, workhorse is the 35% trichloroacetic acid uh, peel used in conjunction with a pretreatment of a Jesner solution. Uh, we always like the patients to be fairly alert and awake uh, during the beginning period of the degreasing, which is done with acetone, um, and when we do the lower eyelids because we like the uh, lower eyelid skin taunt and we want the patient to be able to cooperate. After that, we begin giving the patient a little bit of sedation, a little bit of sedation. We prefer to uh, do the procedure in a systematic fashion, working first again on the upper part of the face uh, with regard to aesthetic subunits and then working down uh, through to the lower part of the face uh, and, then, and then feathering as we get over the angle of the mandible where the shadow is cast uh, so the line of demarcation is not easily uh, or readily seen. So the first thing we're going to do here um, is decrease the patient with acetone and um, we use a standard uh, non-filled 4x4. Uh, the purpose of this is it, it's almost uh, 
in some ways a, a little bit of an abrasion. We're, we're trying to um, remove not just the oil but the stratum corneum. Uh, the most even or the most common cause of an uneven peel is um, an inconsistent or uneven um, degreasing. And um, this is done fairly vigorously uh, in all areas, back and forth. And um, this is generally done in our practice uh, by the uh, nursing staff before uh, we enter the room, but we'll go through it here briefly. Um, and again, it's, it's better to err on the side of over degreasing than under degreasing because it, it leaves, it's much more likely, you're much more likely to have an inconsistent peel uh, and uneven frosting um, as you are um, going through that. Uh, going through that process. So we've uh, briefly degreased the patient, but again, she's, um, uh, you can err on the side of, uh, of overdoing this. Now the first thing we'll do now that the patient is, uh, let me have you just look up for a second there, Margaret, and I'll go on the lower eye as well. Uh, again, sometimes this is a little irritating. The vapors of the acetone are a little irritating. Now you'll notice when we use the fan, we actually try to um, blow across the patient's face. We're not trying to blow into the patient's face. Could I have the um, garbage pail, please? Um, and you'll also notice that anytime we we're done with something on the patient, it goes right into the garbage pail. We don't put it on the prep stand so that we don't inadvertently pick up um, what we didn't plan to pick up. So as we're using the fan, we will blow this lightly across the patient's face, not at the patient, directly at the patient, which will actually start to uh, stimulate tearing and that's uh, less desirable. So we've finished our um, prep. So the first thing we'll do at this point is to pre-treat with the Jesner solution. Now, Kathy, you can uh, go ahead and use the Q-tips. Come on over here, Kathy. You can now. What you'll notice here with the uh, Q-tips, as we're treating the eyes, I have the patient's pick a point uh, up on the ceiling. So let's. Um, you see the corner of that light, Margaret? You can stare right at that. And, and the reason for that is as we're painting this on, it's like trying to paint a sheet. If mm -hmm. the sheet is not taunt, it's very difficult for us to do this. So we want to keep your lower eyelid skin nice and taunt. Now, Kathy will, um, during this process, she will insert some Q-tips, one in the lateral uh, cantal area and one in the medial cantal area. And the whole purpose for this is really just to, um, now we just double checked again, even though the nurse has put this up here, the Jesner solution, we just double checked this again to make sure it's, it's correct. Okay, so at this point we will begin uh, the um, prepping the patient with the Jesner solution. Now the Jesner is also a uh, keratolytic agent um, that it ends up breaking up the stratum corneum and get us down to intact epidermis. Um, you also notice that we always want a whether it's a BSS or whether it's um, uh, just sterile saline on the field in a squeeze bottle, um, in a squeeze bottle so that we can have that in case we inadvertently um, uh, get some peel solution into the patient's eyes um, that we have that uh, nearby. So all we do is we just try to paint this on uh, and roll with a, a gentle rolling motion. Uh, we do try to get right up to the eyelid margin. Now um, do you experience, do you notice a little stinging there Margaret or not really? Just a little Just bit. Just a little bit. Now we often don't use the fan for this part, but if the patient's experiencing some stinging sensation or a little irritation, then well, of course we'll, uh, we'll uh, start to run the fan. Okay. Is that stinging a little bit? Yes. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. Okay. Tell me when you think it's starting to go away. <laughs> yeah. Starting to go away? Mm -hmm. All right. All right, Kathy, why don't you bring those out for just a second. Now, close your eyes. We uh, are very conservative with our peeling on the upper eyelid, but sometimes just for even pigmentation, we'll do a little bit of peel. You can peel right into the uh, hair-bearing hair eyebrow as well, um, and you won't lose the hair. Okay, so we'll, we will do a little degreasing, uh, or excuse me, um, applying of the Jesner solution on the right lower eyelid and wiping and rolling. And um, Kathy is is there with her Q-tips. Now the natural tendency for your assistant is to actually push too hard. All we're trying to do is she's trying to have those Q-tips gently placed to suction out or wick by capillary motion the tears out from running down onto the eyelid. 
Um, we don't want the tears to run out because they will dilute the peel solution. Um, and we certainly don't want the tears running back in, uh, carrying with it either Jesner's solution or the uh, trichloroacetic acid. Um, you still having a little stinging or is that starting to go away it's now as well? Away. Good, okay. All right, let me see you close your eyes. That's good. And then we will gently um, apply some on the upper eyelid into the brow as we did on the other side. Okay, so now we've completed the um, area around the eyes with the Jesner solution. And we apply this now, um, not with Q-tips, but with a, a cotton ball which allows us to absorb a little bit more of the Jesner solution on that. And uh, we will do this systematically. In this patient's particular situation, we'll go ahead and apply this on her nose. Um, first, now the nasal skin is very thick and it doesn't often have much of a peel type reaction or frosting as you'll see. We're extending now into the um, forehead up into the hairline and into the temporal unit. Okay, we're stopping right short of the cheek. So we've done temporal unit, forehead, glabella, um, and into the hairline. Uh, one doesn't have to worry about uh, inadvertently injuring or removing hair. You feel some stinging there, Margaret, a little bit? A little, a little yes. bit, yeah. So we'll complete her the uh, prep solution on the forehead and the nose. And um, now we the only two areas we have left are the um, Cheek units, subunits with extension down on below the angle of the mandible. Okay, now the contralateral right side below the angle of the mandible. And although this, this seems like a relatively uh, straightforward and easy procedure, there is a little bit of a learning curve to it. Uh, as far as getting things on uh, uniformly. And, and when that really shows up is when you start to um, start applying the trichloroacetic acid. If things, uh, the Jesner solution has not been uniformly applied, you start to see that with uneven um, frosting. Now, in this patient, particular situation, we are not seeing a frosting with the Jesner solution, but it is not unusual to see a little bit of a light um, frosting with that um, as we apply the Jesners. Okay, so we've now completed the preparation of the Jesners solution and we will uh, certainly make sure we discard this cotton ball so we don't inadvertently pick that up when we're doing the uh, trichloroacetic acid peel. Okay, at this point we'll begin with the uh, trichlor trichloroacetic acid uh, solution peel. You'll notice the patient's been marked out uh, according to subunits. Now. Um, just a few thoughts, we use the 35%. It is our feeling that you can essentially accomplish the same type of peel with a 20 or 25% percent, percent trichloroacetic acid by leaving it on a little longer and additional applications. With, um, with time and experience, one becomes very comfortable with, with the 35%, and it is rare that we actually use a 15 or 20%, maybe in the younger patient who has very little photo damage and uh, very little uh, or no rightage. But as patient starts to get a little um, over 40 or so, there is generally enough um, photo damage and aging to make it worth uh, treating the patient with, 30, with a 35%. 35% has, has a little bit more of a learning curve and since you reach the tissue reaction faster. Now, it is also worth noting that compared to the Jesner solution, the Jesner solution, if you are seeing a frosting, that is more of a salt deposition uh, and that is uh, can actually be reversible by uh, diluting or wiping it with saline. Whereas when you apply tri trichloroacetic acid, that's a uh, keratocoagulant. And with that, you actually see a protein coagulation. Uh, when you reach that point, the point of visible coagulation or frosting is somewhat irreversible. So when you're applying the solution, you look for first an erythematous erythema coming through the frost, which is a more superficial injury down to the uh, papillary dermis as it turns into a bright white or, um, or, or opaque frost that is more of a uh, uh, reticular uh, dermal injury. Okay, so we'll begin our, our peel now. The patient's had at this point uh, one to two milligrams of Versed when we start to do uh, treatment of the uh, periorbital or eyelid area. And then once we 
go past that, we will start uh, giving the patient a little bit more uh, Versed and Demerol as we move on to the cheeks and do the full face peel. Okay, so Kathy's going to so Kathy is going to at this point reapply the Q-tips to wick the tears, and we will start on the left side, which is um, again we go through this systematically. So we typically start on the left side. Now, Margaret, I want you to stare back up at the ceiling, and this part really does start to sting a little bit. You'll notice that there is a um, a stinging or burning sensation that goes along with this. Um, it's very important not to go beyond the unit or subunit that you are treating. It is very easy to over treat and in other words when we move down onto the cheek to um, come back up onto the eyelid because it goes through a, a period where it starts to frost fairly readily and then it, it breaks up again and goes back through that erythematous phase um, before, uh, before the tissue turns back to a uh, somewhat of a pink or normal normal color. Is that stinging quite a bit there, Margaret? Yeah. Okay, we can turn the fan on now. And you'll notice again that we don't... Uh, let's have you stare right up at the ceiling. That's good, Margaret. Now, it's very important that you don't sedate the patient too much during this part of the procedure. Otherwise, they tend to um, close their eyes and um, become a little uh, more sedated than you would like. We want the patient to cooperate and keep her eye fixed on the point on the ceiling that we pointed out uh, earlier. Now you'll see there's a little bit of a greenish uh, color to this frost, but that's just the uh, uh, indicator um, in the uh, surgical marking pen. Like I said, as you apply, there's somewhat of a lag period, maybe 15 to 20 seconds at least before it reaches its end point. So you don't want to uh, be overzealous and apply too much and get ahead of yourself. You're always trying to assess the uh, degree of frosting and with experience you can get uh, fairly accurate in how much I'm coming back, I'm placing a little more lead medial here. I don't think I need to do much more lateral. And um, how you doing Margaret? Okay. I know that stings quite a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. She's doing quite well. Can you feel that fan at all? Is that helpful? A you may little, have to come in a little bit. A little closer. Okay. Once we've reached what we consider an optimal frost, as we have here, then we will go over and uh, get an iced, cold, iced eye pad or pack, which we then apply, which is very soothing to the patient and uh, eliminates some of the sting. Is it starting to feel better now? Yes. Yeah, it's a cold eye pack. Okay. Okay, Margaret, I want you to again um, pick that point up on the ceiling and stare at that, and I will be going ahead and starting to apply the peel solution, solution to the lower eyelid on the right side. Now, you will notice that there is a little frosting on the upper eye, lid, and brow, and we just lightly treated that. We don't treat it as vigorously as we do the lower eyelid, but we do like to treat that a little bit just so that the um, pigmentation and the uh, complexion is uh, uniform throughout. Nice big breaths, Margaret, okay? There you go. Now we've got, again, we have the fan blowing across the field. We have our um, saline solution in a squeeze bottle nearby. And uh, Kathy is gently starting to wick tears out with care not to apply too much pressure, which actually causes the patients to tear a bit more and um, mm -hmm. is more stimulating. Are you okay? I know. It stings a lot, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to... Look, we're just past, we're starting to see some erythema over here. Most of this is meeting, uh, is reaching a nice whitish frost. Okay, so here comes the nice cold pack on the eye. Um, we talk about this as neutralizing the peel, but it really doesn't neutralize the peel. It just dilutes it to the point that it's ineffective. Um, and it's also very soothing to the patient, but we want to basically stop the peeling uh, once we've uh, reached what we consider a nice um, particular dermal injury, okay? Um, 
Have you gone ahead and given the Demerol? Okay, now that we've pe peeled the um, eyelid and periorbital area, we will first extend, uh, we will extend up onto the forehead. We prefer to peel superiorly and move inferiorly. We would, we would rather do that because we don't want to peel here and then have a drip of peel inadvertently run across the un, uh, or the area that has already been peeled and that to be uh, unnoticed. Um, so at this point, we've peeled the periorbital area very slowly with a a couple of milligrams of Versed, and now since we'll move along fairly quickly on the face, um, we've given the patient some Demerol, and uh, we may even give her a little more uh, Versed. Now again, we'll come back. I, I will do um, the nasal skin first, and um, and then the entire forehead unit and the temporal unit as well. We're taking this into the hairline, being careful not to go beyond what we've marked out as the temporal unit. And this really does start to sting quite a bit for the patient. Are you noticing that? Starting to burn a little bit there, Margaret? Yeah. Okay, worst part's almost over, hon. Okay? Mm-hmm. And now, as you're applying, you're carefully observing the skin. Like I said before, there's approximately 20 seconds or so before you start to reach um, a frost. And you don't want to over-apply. So you, you look at the patient. I know we can get about three applications on there safely before I have anything to worry about. So we will do that. And wait for our end point before we move down onto the lower part of the face. Nice big breath for us, Margaret, okay? That's great. Everything's going very, very well, by the way. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right. As I mentioned earlier, this can be done with no other anesthesia or sedation. We have just found that this works much better. Patients often have vague recollection or of the peeling and Although now and then if we have someone who's very stoic and insists on no sedation, well, um, we go ahead and do that. You'll start to see now she's having a little, there's a little more frosting here. You'll see there's a little more erythematous, uh, erythema showing through here and on this side. So we come back and put another little application here. And you're constantly assessing, going back and forth, looking at the patient and um, determining the end point. Patients who have more pigmentation and deeper wrinkles, uh, you can be more aggressive with. Now you see there's a real nice even frost over here, maybe one more pass, and um, be a bit more aggressive with this side of the face. You almost ready for those cold packs, Margaret? Yeah. Okay, we'll go ahead and put them on in a moment. At this point, at this point we've already uh, reached our maximum frosting on the forehead area. We've started some on the lower face and cheeks and we have uh, cooled down or neutralized the forehead area. We're going to continue on to the lower face looking for the same homogeneous white type of frost uh, that we saw on the upper face. It's important to stay down, go actually go below the angle of the mandible because of the shadowing effect, we don't want to go above that. If, you, if you're a little bit above the angle of the mandible, you actually can see that line of demarcation. So at this point, the only areas we have left are the cheeks, the periorbital area. Now you notice also that the cotton ball is wet, but not drenched to the point that it can drip. We don't want that to run down the patient's neck. If there is a little bit of drip that runs down onto the neck, it's not a problem. Um, but Patients uh, perceive that as 
lack of attention to detail if they see little drips running down their neck. And uh, there's a really no reason for that, so it's just a matter of paying close attention to the patient. And you also know that Kathy has a wet gauze on the forehead. She has that again moist but wrung out. We don't want that soaking wet because as that runs down under the patient's cheek, that will dilute the peel and, and or run down onto the neck and uh, leave some streaking there as well. It looks like to me we're almost done on the left side here, or excuse me, yeah, on the left side of this patient. We have a little more to do on the right side. How you doing, Margaret? Mm -hmm. You ready for this to be done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're almost done, okay? Turn toward me just a little bit, I need to see that side. Okay. Nice white frost. Continue to apply a little more. The right side. Periorbital arm. She's going to end up with a wonderful result. Okay, let me cool down that. Ready for some cold packs on your left side? Mm -hmm. Here they come. Okay, sneak your finger down there, Kathy, if you could. Hold that. Okay, very good. We try to peel and tailor our peeling in the patient to the degree of damage that they have. In other words, if you have a patient that has some periorbital wrink perioral and periorbital wrinkling, but really doesn't have a lot except maybe a little photo damage on the cheeks, well in that patient we don't necessarily go to a deep dermal injury on the cheeks. We look more for that erythema and then we neutralize or stop the peel at that point. And we're just about there in all areas. At this point, we're going to finish by neutralizing the peel in the periorbital area and on the uh, right cheek. There are uh, two additional points I'd like to make. The first one is that if you look at the periorbital area, that frosting is starting to dissipate now, and that's what I was referring to early, earlier, and that it could be, it's very easy that you could over-treat that by coming and saying, well, geez, I, maybe I haven't reached a sufficient frost here. So you'll notice again, it begins to frost and then it dissipates, become erythematous, and goes uh, just to looking like um, kind of a windburn or erythematous skin. That's the first point. So you don't want to over-treat and cross over and that's why it's so important to mark out your aesthetic units and work within uh, the confines of the unit until you move on to another one. The second point again uh, to reiterate is that when we treat the periorbital area we are using q-tips. When we are treating the skin um, on the cheeks and periorbital and forehead area we're using cotton balls and when we Degrease the patient, we're using a non-filled 4x4 gauze, and then we're also using that to cool the patient down um, at the end. The other thing is we're making sure we extend beyond the angle of the mandible so that this is well beyond the uh, shadowing so that the line of demarcation, um, which can be transitioned by diminishing uh, peel as we move inferiorly, um, is uh, uh, much less uh, noticed. So at this point we're going to apply the dressing. The dressing we use is a bland, non, um, excuse me, non-occlusive um, aquaphor uh, dressing. Aquaphor is a petroleum-based um, ointment. We feel that uh, aquaphor is the best uh, choice of a dressing. We do not need to occlude this uh, as we do in the uh, patients who undergo laser resurfacing who have a lot less discomfort um, with, uh, with an occlusive dressing. But we do like something bland or uh, we have tried 
almost every type of dressing and ointment out there and have com continued to come back to Aquaphor. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive and you might have uh, much less likely of a uh, or a much lower incidence of um, contact dermatitis or der dermatologic problems. One of the problems with many of the um, so-called ointments or creams that are formulated for post peel or post laser patients is that the companies as well intended as they are put ingredients or fragrance fragrances in the ointment that can be then create can cause a hypersensitivity to the patient in fact there have been um, creams and ointments that we have used all of a sudden start developing problems and come to find out that the manufacturer has changed the formulation so um, and certainly they can do that without notifying you there's there's um, it is not a drug per se so again we've come back to just an aquaphor ointment which is applied for the first several days and we will review this in uh, much greater detail in the uh, post-operative sessions that we have with this patient uh, when we follow her along and we go through the uh, various types of dressing dressings and moisturizer